And I'm also going to share us to Facebook. Because why not? But thank you all for being here. And I will let you guys do your thing. Thank you, everybody who's out in the audience for coming to the summit. I hope that you decide to stick around for the rest of the weekend. Thank Many you. blessings. Thanks, Daniel. Thank you. All right. Welcome, everybody. Hello. Um, Mike and Michael, maybe we can mute our microphones and then unmute um, when we address questions. Um, yeah, welcome, everybody. So as you probably know, the name of this panel um, is Psychedelic Narcissism and Epistemic Rabbit Holes. So just before we start, I do want to talk a little bit about what it is that we want to talk about, because I don't assume that we necessarily understand uh, this terminology in the same way. So narcissism, I think the most important aspect of that word is that we're not referring to narcissism as in the way that we pathologize somebody in a clinical way for whatever personality traits they have that turns into a narcissist. I mean, nowadays we do use that word very often uh, in a very unhealthy way uh, to just pathologize and uh, label people that don't necessarily agree <laughs> with us in different ways. Like, oh, like, a, you know, like that one with narcissism, whatever. Uh, narcissism, I think we use that in a more cultural or social sense as that aspect of our Western or Westernized cultures and societies uh, is an offshoot of hyper-individualism, is an offshoot of romanticism. Um, it's a way that really glorifies uh, individual feeling or individual perception over like a more intellectual or collective sense making as like, oh, this is what I know, this is my truth, and hence uh, this is the truth as opposed to just a truth, right? So narcissism uh, as a failure of the individual to see themselves as located in a very particular individual reality tunnel, assuming that our reality or our perception of reality must be the general reality, yeah? Um, the other word that I just want to very quickly uh, frame is epistemology. Okay? It's a very fancy academic word. Epistemology basically is one of the classical uh, branches of classical philosophy, which deals with uh, the science of knowledge. How do we know what we know? Uh, what is our relationship with knowledge in general? So how do we construct knowledge? And how do we know that that knowledge that we construct is actually valid or true? Yeah. So when we say epistemic rabbit holes, we're kind of referring to this process yeah, of like constructing a body of knowledge and relating to that knowledge, both individually, but also collectively. Yeah. Like in psychedelics, this obviously gets exacerbated because we are encountering the numinous, we're encountering the weird, the bizarre, we're encountering the ineffable, that which is very difficult to talk about. Yeah. So we're basically uh, just speculating a lot about what things are, uh, how they present to us, and trying to communicate that to each other and build some sort of framework or blueprint for others to navigate to. Uh, and it is kind of, you know, it, it, it is relatively easy to forget that all we are doing is trying to build some blueprint or some framework, uh, but the map is never the territory. Yeah, so how do we build better maps? How do we build these cartographies of the psychedelic experience or the mind and the psyche in general uh, that are useful for everybody without you know, like imposing our view of it? Uh, that's it, the last word, conspirituality. It's kind of like a portmanteau of these beautiful words, conspiracy in one hand, spirituality. On the other hand, conspirituality is actually a word that was coined by a researcher. Her name is uh, Charlotte Ward. This is more than a decade ago. Uh, she was researching the new age, philosophy, spirituality, religion scene. And she noticed that correlation between people who adhere to these new spiritualities. And also they, we have a tendency to gravitate towards what some people call conspiracy theories, which of course is a problematic term on its own. We're probably gonna unravel that a little bit. Conspirituality has come to the forefront of public discourse very recently because in the last year we have had a few events that have brought that back to the spotlight. Yeah, we have had obviously the whole QAnon thing unraveling 
uh, and you know, just noticing the way that psychedelic spirit, like psychedelic communities and wellness communities and yoga influencers and all sorts of prominent people in these scenes kind of like fell down that rabbit hole and QAnon became a thing that was very powerfully pushed forward uh, by the different facets of the spirituality, wellness, yoga, new age communities. Uh, and the other one that is very evident is the COVID-19 situation and a whole range of different ideas and views of what, what that actually means that also obviously has been a part of public discourse, which has kind of, again, facilitated a lot of this conspirituality revival amongst many of us. So I think that's it as far as like the three main words that I feel important just to communicate in that sense. Now I'm going to just allow each of the participants to introduce ourselves. So me first, my name is Adam. Uh, I am interested in these themes. I have been for a very long time. I'm a doctoral student. My main field is medical anthropology, cultural psychiatry. Basically, I have been looking at mental health for a very long time, uh, both from a clinical perspective and more recently, my focus has shifted from the clinical towards the culture and the social, just seeing how mental health manifests, not necessarily in the individual, but in these relationships between the individual and the community, the individual and the society, the individual and the culture in which we immerse, and obviously the environment which holds us. Uh, so yeah, I mean, that's pretty much me. Do you, Jennifer? <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you, Adam. Yeah. Uh, my name is Jennifer Sodini. I'm the founder of a website called evolveandascend.com. And I'm the author of an Oracle card deck and series called the Menti Oracle. I've been navigating the psychedelic space since 2013. And I'm really interested in this nexus point between art and philosophy and kind of bridging the gap between both of these worlds, like how imagination creates a reality. What does that mean without getting lost in new age lingo? Um, just taking a really like grounded approach to the ineffable. So that's me. Michael? Yes, that is my name. I am Michael Phillip. I host the Third Eye Drops podcast. I'm also a writer. I share many of the same fascinations that have already been outlined. I definitely want to say, Adam, that was a fabulous introduction. And I think that that might be the most nutritious bit of this whole thing. You, you've, you've laid out a smorgasbord of fascinating questions in front of us. And that's the same thing I tend to do. I am not an answer um, preacher. I am much more of a question surfer and a curiosity uh, entertainer. And I, if anything, look for open-endedness and continuation of questions more than I look for answers. Um, there's a great, I believe it's a Krishnamurti quote and it's something along the lines of uh, a mind that's filled with answers is a dead mind. And um, I actually have mis mixed feelings on Krishnamurti, but I do like that quote. I'll, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> hey, what's up, everybody? I'm Mike. I host a podcast called Mike Delic. All these guys have been on, including Daniel. And um, yeah, I'm just really excited to be here. I've been... Uh, on the spiritual path or on whatever path, whatever path you want to call it, the path to find some semblance of meaning and purpose in life uh, for a long time. And really, I'm just here to promote my, my new course that I hope everyone signs up for, Sacred Flatulence, uh, Release the Divine Power of Your Sacred Divine Butt Wind. Uh, maybe we use the word sacred and divine too much, but uh, I'm definitely the least narcissistic here. Uh, so... Um, <laughs> that's, uh, that's, that's all I'll say. And I'll throw links into that, uh, to that course. It's only $12,000 a month for 72 months. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you, everybody. I definitely want to sign up for that course, Mike. I hope you can get a friend discount for it. Uh, <laughs> right. So, yeah, I mean, that's something that is also very important for us to communicate when it comes to narcissism. I think like one thing that we all share in common also is like that relative self-awareness and self-deprecating approach that we can also all recognize in our respective paths. 
how often uh, or sometimes or at some points yeah, in our journeys, we have been uh, on that side of the equation. And we, you know, I mean, at least I cannot speak for myself for sure. Um, you know, like in some sort of like moral high ground or even like epistemic moral ground, like, hey, like I know better than you do, or like this is how things are and so on and so forth. And uh, I think this is something that is inevitable oftentimes, particularly when psychedelics or plant medicines that tend to be not only ineffable, but highly meaningful personal experiences, uh, you know, like immaturity or like the beginner's mind in that particular path can lead us oftentimes to think that we are given, uh, you know, the truth or the answer. And then oftentimes, and this comes from a, from a po positive aspect, like I have now for myself, like, oh, like I have now that wisdom and it is my duty now to communicate that to everybody and make sure that everybody gets it, right? So that's kind of like where I'm at when it comes to like the narcissistic part of it, yeah? Not necessarily, again, like not in the pathologizing aspect of like a personality disorder necessarily, but in that uh, inability to recognize, yeah, uh, the individual aspect of it. So yeah, so I think uh, Michael, if you if you'd like to, uh, I I would like to ask you about your personal understanding of what narcissism e uh, means <laughs> for you, and how do you see that the psychedelic experience can potentially end up feeding into that narcissism, uh, and how do we remain vigilant about the potential pitfalls in our path? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think mythologically, like the myth of narcissists is a great parallel to not only the psychedelic experience, but self-discovery and self-work in general, because there are so many opportunities along the way to just completely delude yourself or hang on to one small thing that feels right or that alleviates, you know, uh, existential anxiety or whatever. I mean, even, you know, everybody here, we come out of a numinous experience, right? And we hang some kind of significance on it. We, we all assume that it must mean something, right? Like, oh, this, this can't be a bunch of uh, abnormal neurochemical behavior. This must all mean something. Like, and I say this as someone who thinks it means something. But the, that very act, that very interpretive act in and of itself could be a kind of narcissism, right? Like, I don't know. This could be like a self-relativistic illusion that I'm like just dipping my head into, you know, narcissist style. And, and I'm getting uh, enthralled by the, the fractal weirdness of my own mind that doesn't mean anything. Maybe that's the case. I don't know. I don't think that's what it means, but who, who am I to say? So, and I mean, that, that's a very like surface level example and it gets when human psychology and the particulars of, of everybody comes into play the 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 trauma the weird ideas the commercials we've watched the smash mouth albums we've listened to like all of these things sort of like coalesce into some kind of one large thing that is our psyche and then we try to extrapolate meaning from this ever flowing river of phenomenon. And that in and of itself is a tricky, tricky thing to do. And I think it could be skillfully argued that that whole act could be a narcissistic thing. I don't think it is, but I wanted to start there just to, just to give it like the broadest possible outline. And I think for me, the way that I see it start to become a little bit toxic, in my humble opinion, is when it kind of trans transforms into a noticeable peacock feather. You know, it starts to become this part of the persona plume of the individual. And, you know, it, it's right there alongside the the belongings alongside the status alongside the social media presence or whatever and i say this full well knowing that i too portray and play these games you know but i think the for me the way i try to be responsible 
with psychedelic exploration or with personal uh, anagogic exploration in general is to try to focus in on the wrinkles, try to focus in on the areas that I know need work, try to like look into the ugly shadows, you know, try to grapple with my mortality, try to grapple with my narcissism, try to grapple with all of the different um, psychological shortcomings that I know I do have. And I think if you can keep it in that kind of a spirit where it really is self-work instead of uh, an act of self-elevation, I don't know if I can say that's the right track, but for me, that feels better and it feels more authentic. And I think it yields a better result because you actually then do have some kind of growth you can measure. You know, you actually can say like, I've breached a new area of my shadow. I've realized I'm afraid of these things. And because I'm afraid of these things, they've been holding me back from doing X, Y, and Z. And, and to me, that feels right. That feels authentic. That feels less narcissistic than the former, at least a little bit. Mike, do you have anything uh, that you would like to add to that same topic? Yeah, I guess, you know, it's... Um... It's very chaotic, you know, I think within the psychedelic space, we always want to try our best to control the variables that we can, you know, we hear the word like safe space, or this is a safe space or, you know, uh, set and setting and, and things of that nature, which are all very important. However, the experience itself sometimes is very, very chaotic and very, uh, can be disassociating and, um, bring up a lot of those parts, like Michael was talking about these shadow aspects, you know, the parts that we all don't want to look at, you know, so so as sort of culture at large goes, you know, I think we see that ripple out and these kinds of movements of, you know, it becomes okay to be a narcissist because it's become normalized by these shadow projections. Um, and when we normalize that behavior, we're going to get things that create lives of their own and are, you know, these mythologies become alive from the shadows. And I think we've been seeing that a long time in our culture and um, more it's ramping up exponentially. Uh, and I think it's a real crisis. Yeah. 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 And I think there's something to be said about that of like, a big issue is I think when we have these experiences that we want to hold on to, whether we're touching the light or we're reaching down into our shadow, they then become something that's like this identity, this thing that we shroud ourselves in, this hashtag that we become to market ourselves. It degrades into a form of kitsch, right? I've touched the top of the mountain. Now here I am. I've seen this thing and I'm going to shout it from the rooftops. It's going to become a hashtag. I'm going to put it into a piece of merchandise instead of focusing on like, how can I actually embody these things, right? You have this initiation where you see the world in a completely different way and not realizing that there's so many other steps and these levels of awareness that we're traversing, right? There's not like any end point. It's like always the dot, dot, dot. And I think that's the danger is that so many times I've seen and I've directly participated in, like when I was in my extreme first times touching this space, being so naive and thinking, oh my God, like <laughs> nobody else can know this. This is me, I'm gonna be the one to say it. Me, 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 me. It's again, like Michael said, I think the narcissist myth is so important to this conversation too, because you know he takes a glimpse at his own reflection in the water and falls in love with it. But when you think of like this as like a deeper metaphor, like to try and grab that reflection, it's just water falling through your hands. So instead of being able to observe directly, move on, embody, instead of now identifying in such a large way, um, it's interesting, it's just like reconciling our, our impulses of what we wanna do when we receive this information. I think a lot of it is like impulsively, now I identify as this, this has become me, I've built a whole identi identity around it instead of how do I embody this and relate to my world in a deeper way. 
Yeah, great. I mean, this is this is a beautiful bridge into into the next question. Um, kind of like my my own training, I'm always looking at structures, right? Like 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 the critical approach to to structures and how we're embedding things. Um, yeah, like one of the main driving forces uh, in modernity uh, that not always is recognized as such is this very unique and remarkable shift towards individualism. That like we are probably uh, as you know, like I, I use these terms loosely, but Western society in general, the individualism that we all of us take for granted that like really glorifies and kind of like encases the individual as a unit, yeah, oftentimes detached from our interconnectedness to our community and our society. Uh, it's something that is very unique in the history of uh, humankind. And I think we're still grappling with that new awareness of us as individuals. And I think often what I have seen, I didn't mention this in the beginning as I introduced, introduced myself or other than the um, academic part, I've also have been working for four years um, facilitating workshops, mostly with, with ayahuasca. And one of the main tendencies that I have seen over and over and over again, particularly with people who have had some sort of influence by this new spirituality, it's like this new way to try and reconfigure spirituality in a non-religious denomination, which oftentimes like this new age wave, right? Like new age is by itself a, a, a vehicle that intensifies tremendously this individualistic mindset. Yeah, because in like religion and spiritualism stop being something collective and become something really personal. Like I have my own personal connection with the divine and I am my own nexus with the numinous and so on and so forth, right? So what I have seen oftentimes is that people can, and including myself, we can get oftentimes very lost into that kind of like mindset that says, oh, like my own personal experience, whatever experience, like my own intuition, like my own truth, whatever resonates with me, right? Like we've all heard that all the time. Oh, like that resonates with me, hence it must be true, right? Oh, that doesn't resonate with me, hence that must be false. Like oftentimes we evaluate information uh, according to what resonates with us, which when we start thinking about it, like this is an extremely dangerous thing because this is something that Michael was mentioning. Like oftentimes uh, we are incredibly unaware of why that resonates with us. Yeah, like we tend to think that things resonate with us because they must be inherently true, but not often do we take into account, yeah, that we must be extremely biased over certain things because A, whatever trauma we suffered in childhood, whatever trauma, whatever happened in our life has predisposed us to um, kind of like take some knowledge rather than other, like cultural predisposition, cognitive biases, which are a massive thing. I mean, the way that we think, which is incredibly biased. This, by the way, used to be part of like a classical education. People who went into school, they used to receive training into cognitive biases and logical thinking. These are things that people don't learn anymore. So it's very, very easy for us to get swayed in our opinions, thinking that actually this is our personal individual truth while actually this is just a manipulation that we're not even aware of. So, I mean, this is a very big topic, yeah? Like how we actually construct knowledge and what are the reasons or what are the evidence that we have to believe that our belief, I, Robert Anton Wilson has a quote that I love, which is like, he said, don't believe everything that you think, right? Which should be kind of like, kind of like a big uh, banner, yeah, in everybody's lintel. Don't believe everything that you think. Uh, because oftentimes, again, like we are unaware of what actually leads us to believe certain things. So there are some tools and some boundaries actually that can help us include intuition and include our personal feeling and include whatever is within us that wants to say like this is true and this is not. Yeah, like some people call that intuition and so on and so forth. Um, but again, like it is important to have tools to be able to discern what resonates with us because it is true or what resonate, resonates with us because of our own personal trauma or our cultural programming and so on and so forth. So how can we include, this is a question for Jennifer actually, how can we include that intuition or that personal sense of knowing within a broader uh, process of sense making, yeah, that includes intuition, includes like our personal input, but doesn't necessarily reduce everything to just like, oh, this is true because this resonates with me. Well, I think 
uh, the thing is, what is true? So Mike and I had kind of a call just to check up before this. And I had referenced a quote from the Kabbalion, which is this idea that all truths are but half truth, every truth is half false. What is truth, but something that may be plausible. So to arrive at a space of absolute certainty, I think is really dangerous. So kind of creating a boundary within yourself of saying like, well, what is certainty? Can we ever arrive at absolute certainty? Where does truth begin? Where does truth end? Having that boundary. So like when I first kind of landed in this space, I got so wrapped up in the 2012 end of the world rabbit hole that became all consuming to the point that I literally thought that the world was going to end. And I was just like, oh my God, what is happening? And so many things that I was researching at the time, because before I dived into this space, I worked in pop culture. I was like more in kind of like the entertainment side of media. I didn't have tools to discern the information that I was looking at. So I would just get lost in these YouTube rabbit holes and be like, oh my God, this feels so true to me. This feels so true. This must be true. That wasn't until years of being in this space, having proper ways to discern discernment, right? Like that's a really great operative word for this thing. And it's hard because again, if you get into this conspiratorial mindset, can you look on Snopes? Some people say, oh my God, Snopes, don't look at Snopes, it's bad. But just being able to objectively look and research and Google <laughs> or use DuckDuckGo, whatever you wanna use, but to not arrive at, I, I've read two articles, they confirm my bias, it feels right, it feels good. No, I'm gonna stay in this nebulous space and say, okay, something may be off or feel weird, but I'm not going to subscribe to this is absolute truth now because I found the thing that's confirming what I'm, I'm feeling, leaving space that there's still room for more to be presented or for things to be complex. Michael Philip and I love this one meme in particular where it's the Scooby-Doo meme. You guys might have seen it before, but you know, in Scooby-Doo, it's always like the villain gets revealed at the end of it. And it's like, the first one says like great conspiracies, but everything's connected. And then it gets revealed and it's like, oh, fear of a chaotic universe. So again, going back to chaos and befriending chaos is something else that I would suggest. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and I think one of the things that is really exacerbated by the hyper individualistic mindset that seems to come with being an American is this idea that you must have an opinion and that you must have an answer. And just instead, maybe the villain in this Scooby-Doo meme is that. Like the, the, this overarching narrative of like, well, at, at the end of everything you read, you better know what side you're on. You better know what the answer is. You better not be able to tolerate any gray area. And that, and I'm a huge Robert Anton Wilson fan as well. And that's one of the things that he would always do in all of his books is he would, you know, tell you to look at synchronicity, for instance, as a phenomenon where you're, you're looking for quarters on the ground. And just by thinking about quarters on the ground, you're manifesting quarters into your life. And then on the next page, he'll say, now do that where you just think that you're finding more quarters because you're perceiving more quarters and that's what you're looking for. And that's reinforcing your bias for looking for quarters. And then he's not saying to come out of that and choose He's saying, do the reps of all sides, do the reps of all sides. And in doing the reps on all sides, you now can hold that cognitive dissonance. You now can understand that you don't know and you're not going to know. You know, you don't know if there's some consciousness magic trick behind the scenes that has, you know, uh, you know, sprouted life across the universe in some kind of top down way or some sort of bottom up way where we crawled out of the oceans and then became, you know, multi-celled. And then we be, you know, the Cambrian explosion happened and we got mammals and all of the, you know, it's like, you, like, or it's both or some mixture of the two. That's what we have such a hard time doing. And because we have such a hard time doing that, we aren't able to look at whatever our chosen, um, you know, whatever we have been put into a situation on whatever topic, we're not able to look at it divorced of emotion. And that's one of the things that, that Adam just uh, alluded to is that a classical education used to 
include rhetoric. It used to include the classics. It used to include getting a full belly of the basic philosophical ideas and, you know, you know, all of the different tensions that have existed across the spectrum of human thought. And by doing that, you're, you're able to go out into the world. And while it might not help you pay your taxes, it will help you sense make much better. And that's, I think that's the big price that we're paying now for losing the classics and losing philosophy is that we we're doing cartoon philosophy. We're, we're fucking like, you know, we're, we're on these, we're having these absolutely cartoonish arguments. We're, we're demonizing. We're spending all of our times doing ad hominem attacks on the character of people, you know, saying that, you know, liberals are baby eaters and, you know, right wingers are all Nazis. It's like we 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 don't have the ability to use nuance anymore. And nuance, to me, it, it, if I have a religion, it's probably nuance. <laughs> yeah, that that really uh, resonates with me. Both of what you said, I I feel that in my in my personal truth. And you know, I think you guys are pretty. We all, we all can feel pretty certain about uncertainty. So. Yeah, I, I think that uh, we really, whether it's in the, conspira the conspiracy area domain or the spirituality domain, and there's a reason why I think they've come together, right? Because there is this seeking to want to find a comfortable and convenient narrative that we can rest upon, right? whether it's you know spiritual, the spiritual materialism aspect of it or the bypassing as aspect of it. It's like we are always searching for something that really fulfills us with a purpose and a meaning and a mission and as jennifer said before like you're the chosen one you're you know the secrets you know the mysteries now it's your job to find the other people and go on this quest to take down the whatever or bring rise to the kingdom of what zordon or something <laughs> from power rangers yeah yeah Yeah, good. I I love this conversation. So yeah, I mean, thank thank that. You know, um, there's 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 many reasons why it becomes increasingly difficult to make sense of the world. Yeah, you know, this is not necessarily only because of individualism, not only because all of these different tendencies, but also there's something actually out there in the world. Yeah, that is true. That is real. That is creating more and more and more layers. Yeah. That make it difficult, more and more difficult for people to 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 make sense of it. Yeah, I mean, there is a real tendency towards the weaponization of narrative, towards the weaponization of information in all sorts of different ways. Yeah, for the sake of agendas that are not necessarily transparent or that are not necessarily aligned with the well-being of everybody. And some of these things oftentimes get uh, lumped or clumped into conspiracy theory, which has become some sort of like a disparaging term to dismiss all sorts of different things that don't necessarily fit the official narratives, which is not a great thing. We can all agree on that. Um, and oftentimes, just by saying that, saying like, oh, this is just a conspiracy, kind of takes away from the actual truth that there may be something there that uh, is not transparent. And history has shown that many of these things that people have thought, oh, this is just a conspiracy, actually were true. Yeah, like the world is full of conspiracies. Conspiracies are happening all the time. Now, there is a difference between a conspiracy, let's say, that happens uh, behind closed doors because, let's say, pharmaceutical companies have a bottom line. They want to make profit. So, like, oh, like, we'll just go so and so and so and so so we can make profit. Um, and there's another way of looking at conspiracies, which is something that I think, like, Jennifer was um, alluding to before, which stems not necessarily from actually wanting to understand how the world works, but from a different inclination, which is I need to feel that I am in control of things or that at the very least somebody else is in control of things because I cannot bear the thought that maybe the world is chaotic. I cannot bear the thought that maybe nobody is in control. Yeah. I cannot bear the thought that maybe there isn't a master plan behind things that is driving historical events. So there is kind of like a genuine, honest aspect of it, which is like, oh, I want to find out how the world works. Yeah. So we can actually like figure things out and like make this world 
a better world. And then there's the other side of it, which is like, for my own personal comfort and my own personal anxiety, I need to believe yeah, that somebody else is behind these things. And I think sometimes these things can not only be based on like our particular psychological needs, but also can oftentimes be weaponized for political uh, projects. I mean, we have seen that throughout history, the protocols of the elders of Zion kind of being the prime uh, example of that, like the blood libel, which has been peddled like, oh, like the Jewish people are blood drinking uh, lizards and so on and so forth, which has mutated over history time and time and time again. Uh, in each era kind of resurrected to fit the bill of whoever has like that political inclination to demonize a certain population. Yeah, like a, whole, a core tenant of this, of a big part of this political conspiracy theories is always to create an other, yeah, like to other uh, whoever is on the other side of the coin, yeah, because dehumanizing the other is the best way in which you can carry out kind of like a nefarious political agenda. And I think we're seeing a resurrection of that right now in some different ways. I mean, we saw that throughout the whole Trump uh, presidency and the whole Trump campaign, which had like a very strong kind of like populist undertone of like creating like an other, yeah, like you're not with us, you are the other. And then that whole QAnon kind of like event that came unraveling through it, which was based on like very, very old tropes. I mean, the QAnon, Pizzagate, like the whole uh, blood level of like the liberals are blood drinking elites in Hollywood and so on and so forth. Uh, and these are very tricky things to navigate because on one hand we can immediately see what the motivations may be, but on the other hand, we also don't want to dismiss that maybe there is some kernel of truth behind some of these things that is important for us to pay attention to while being completely carried out into the hysteria and kind of like the mass delusion. So, yeah, I mean, one of the main issues with that is that we have lost trust in institutions. Yeah, like for the most part, the majority of people nowadays, we don't have a lot of trust in government. We don't have a lot of trust in the major institutions that rule our lives. A uh, prime example of that are the pharmaceutical industry. I think that very few people, particularly maybe psychedelic people who know the actual power of pharmacology, uh, many like, very few people can actually say like pharmaceutical companies are benevolent. I mean, they have their own agendas. They have a very strong profit incentive. Uh, so we don't have much trust that whatever they say is actually for our benefit and not for some other purpose. So whether that's governments or whether that's pharmaceutical companies or even nowadays public health officials have lost a lot of trust yeah, because we have been fed for a whole year. We have been fed this narrative about a virus that seems to be, and again, I say this with a lot of reservation, but seems to be way inflated and not concordant to what the actual reality in the ground is. So when people put all of this together, it kind of like becomes very easy to get swept away into a global narrative of saying like, oh, like this is all false. There must be somebody on the top dictating all these events for some sort of different agenda. Uh, so Mike, maybe this is a good question for you. Um, so given this lack of trust that we have in institutions, in governments, in pharmaceutical companies, how in your view, yeah, we can hold true for us as individuals, as communities. How can we hold what is true for us? Uh, and first, like to what degree can we be certain that that is actually true? Yeah, I mean, it's maybe true for us, but to what degree can we be certain that's true for others as well? How can we hold that for us without, first of all, being immediately like ridiculed or dismissed by others or being kind of lumped into like some sort of like, dismissive group of ah, this is just a conspiracy theorist or these are like just QAnon followers so this is like conspiritual whatever um but instead of that how can we actually like create spaces or create the interactions where we can fruitfully and in a constructive way kind of like engage in dialogue about topics that are inherently divisive and difficult yeah um <clears throat> well i i think it it helps to have allies that you can check in with to be, you know, to, to have these kinds of discussions and say, Hey, I'm finding some stuff here and I want to know it, it kind of is ringing true for me. And are you, are you seeing the same thing that I'm seeing? Like, 
I think that it, it really helps to have people around you that you can bounce ideas off of in a really deep, like get really nitty gritty with a lot of things. Um, and I always find that it really helps to, so we're talking about how this stuff kind of blows up and becomes this alluring, uh, you know, kind of modern mythology of conspiracy, right? And, and we, we attach to these kinds of archetypes and we blow them out of proportion. Um, and I think that that happens kind of everywhere we go. Uh, and it's, I think it's really sexy, you know, it's really appealing. It's really like we want that grand story uh, to unfold. We want to believe that, you know, we're getting messages from the Pleiades and they're telling us that Donald Trump is the savior or whatever the hell the, the thing is, right? Uh, that's way more appealing and sexy. Like you, will, you would want to see a movie about that, right? Uh, but what's not appealing, what's not sexy is where does the money go? Who's funding things and why? You know that that seems to be kind of like really dry and really boring, right? So I saw someone in the in the chat say uh, 9/11 was an inside job, and that's like a great like distillation of that, right? Because it, it's like, well, it, it's really simple to just say that, but in a, in a way, it kind of is half true. Like there's paradox everywhere we go. So for me it becomes really challenging and really difficult to hold all that. Um, so I really need to kind of check in with people and tell them where I'm at. Sometimes I have like emotional outbursts, sometimes publicly, but people will come and they'll check me. And I really appreciate that. I really appreciate people checking me. I'm very open to that as well. Um, and I think it's, it's, it can become, you can become consumed in the mud and the toxicity, uh, and for, for me personally, I'm talking about, I can, I become consumed sometimes in the particular energy of the rabbit holes that I'm going down because I'm trying to understand from the point of view, not of the, the critics, but of, of the adherence to, to these certain kinds of, um, conspiracies. Right. And I'll just say it's, it's like to my point of it being more alluring and sexy, right? Like we all know about the Jeffrey Epstein thing and you know, that kind of stuff. But even now, as I say this, I can, I feel an energy of like, Oh no, that's going down conspiracy thing. Say there's children. So we've already put it into this camp where it becomes tarnished, where we're not allowed to step into the, the gray terrain of nuance. Um, but the, the, the part that I'm, I'm addressing is we, we, we heighten it even more. And I, I say we because everything is a psyop. We're both the victims and the perpetrators. We're the conspiracy. We're all in it. We're all complacent in some way and complicit in some way. Um, so, so that being said, like with that whole Jeffrey Epstein thing, it's like, and then it gets exaggerated to where you have these kinds of Q people talking about, well, they eat babies and they drink their blood and the adrenochrome as if it's not like bad enough that they're actually molesting children and there's um, sex crimes and these kinds of operations, sex trafficking happening in the world. Like we want the story. We want the Godzilla versus King Kong kind of big CGI action flick, whether it's mainstream, you know, corporate press, politics, government, science, medical facility. You know, we're all trying to come up with something that's really sexy and alluring. And, uh, you know, so I always try and go back to the boring to, to like kind of money power why why would somebody push this agenda why would they be doing this it's like who's funding what where's the money go and you know that's kind yeah. of boring yeah yeah the occam's razor isn't the sexiest but it's like the best tool most of the time that, that i totally agree with that and you, you know what i thought of when you were talking about how we always want it to be more is there are these people who like some youtubers who snuck on to epstein's island and remember all this, do you guys remember the speculation about the temple on the island? There was this Middle Eastern looking temple. And then there was all the speculation that it was a temple to Molech, which is this God that people sacrifice babies to and all this shit. And these guys go to this temple, these YouTubers, and you get there and you see that it's just an empty facade. It's like particle board that's painted, you know? And it's like... 
there, and there was a huge part of me that was so disappointed by that. I wanted them to open that shit up and I wanted there to be like bones inside and like crazy satanic stuff everywhere. Like, oh my God, they found, but that's not what happened. It was like a, a, a facade, you know? And I think that that is the the double-edged sword of mythology is is that it can be our whole reason for everything it brings context to the psyche you know the hero's journey is a beautiful myth with myriad almost infinite interpretations that can fit the individual and also lift up the whole while at the same time lifting up the individual, but at the same time, it can also delude the individual and it can make us drunk with just, we want more, we want more. The next Marvel movie's gotta have a higher budget and more explosions and more superheroes, more. And when we get stuck in that, we're, we are definitely starting to stray from what's real. And we're definitely starting to get brainwashed. We're, we're just chasing dopamine in a new way. You know, we're just we're just upping that high in a new way. We're not really doing any quality meeting, meaning making, or shadow work, or or getting down into the dirt. We're just we're just going with what looks interesting. You know, and and I think a lot of the times when people are supposedly telling the truth, really what they're doing is what's funny is bullshit in the philosophical technical term. Like there's a there's a famous um, essay called "On Bullshit," and I'm forgetting who wrote it now. But the, basically, he points out that there is this tendency for bullshit to masquerade as the truth. And what bullshit is, if I remember correctly, is when a person's primary motivation for arguing with you or sharing information with you isn't to actually tell you the truth. It's to push their opinion or their agenda or their emotion, not not tell you the truth. And I think that, you know, if you just go into any kind of divisive Facebook conversation or social media interaction or talking head segment, clearly they're not actually trying to get to the truth or the truth is sort of a ancillary element hanging out on the side of what they're really trying to do, which is to, 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 you know, signal to their group, like, look, I'm doing the right thing and I'm doing the right thing um, to, to keep you or to keep my status as part of this group. Um, and this is sticky because I'm not saying there is no truth. There is no truer thing. There is no, um, morality and that it's all completely relative but to an extent it is grayer than we'd like to admit and the jury is out on the reality more than we would like to admit yeah well said i just i would love to just say something really quickly about that because i i, I resonate michael um with the wanting the grand reveal right? We want to know what's going on with the magic show. It's like it's the same thing in, in spirituality, in psychedelics. We're always wanting to get to some place. A lot of us fall into that trap of wanting to arrive at a destination. And the conspiracy realm, which I, you know, I definitely occupy a lot of that space to try and kind of figure things out too from where they see things, is there, there, there seems to be this energy of we want the, the big surprise, the finale of like a series. Like we watched The Sopranos and we were all disappointed when it cut to black. It's like, no, we wanted the, we wanted the big thing. And so the same thing plays out in life. And I, I like to say uh, an Alan Watts quote where he says, you know, life is not about getting to a destination, but it is like music. And the point is to dance along the way. Um, yeah. I love that, Mike. Actually, that's that's that video was one of my favorites. I think the South Park creators did it. Um, but I just kind of wanted to touch on the point too. Like again, this word like nuance being so important, or being able to say like oh, a yes and thing, but just not projecting so much again projection onto things. I think often about you know a lot of the conspiracies that I was really attracted to. And I'm still attracted to is this idea of how they 
you know, they, the cabal, they hide their symbols in art and music videos and films. And it's all like predictive programming, psychological operations, this, that, and the other thing. And I used to like go bonkers reading all these esoteric film analysis. I'm like, whoa, all of this, but how much is this me just projecting? And are these people actually like wrapped up in some grand conspiracy? And we tend to dehumanize or again, blanket or project on things without nuance and realizing like, a lot of people that are working in film and are in the arts are curious you know i think of like music videos i've worked on where we've actually like created sigils and put them in and it's like we take away that there are other people that are actively participating in their creativity and imagination and fashion fascination with symbol and these things and they're not necessarily to feed the baby eating agenda so again that act of nuance i mean like okay well this is actually a person too how do we like not blanket and remember that everything is like they're people peopling another alan watts and I love, I saw somebody had referenced the Adam Curtis documentary that I, I obsessed, we blew through the whole thing, can't get you out of my head. But I think back also to, again, another point we're touching on like this fear porn thing. So much of it's, it's sexy, it's sexy, the explosions. Like Adam Curtis did a montage of all of like the explosions and it was like this explosion, explosion, explosion. It's just, we're, we're edging our way to nothing, you know? So it's like, it's very tricky. The, the other thing I just wanted to say before we before we move on from this one is one of the best pieces of evidence, I think, for what we're arguing for is that when we do uncover a real coordinated conspiracy, it usually like goes down the news toilet within like a day. Like I remember, so so a great example right now is everything that's happening with UFOs where we have all of this actual government admission that like yep yep that was we captured that and no and it's it's building now kind of but because it's not raw in people's emotional reality right now it's just not that big of a deal and like even more boring i remember a few years ago they did a probe into these international banks that they thought were doing sketchy practices and they found that they were meeting up in internally hosted chat rooms exchanging encrypted information with the aim of manipulating world financial markets no one cared like nobody cared so it's not even that we you know really want the conspiracy as much as we want like the fear porn, the emotion porn, the figuring out how it makes sense in our own story of ourselves and our own persona is is what we I, I think is the dirty secret. You know, I think that's that's one of the unacknowledged shadow tendencies of people for sure, myself included. I mean, I'm not exonerating myself. I'm so glad that you referenced that too, Michael, because it is like I remember laughing, like, wow, the New York Times literally released we have off-world craft people don't care like whatever like nothing but again if we're going to use sex as a metaphor it's like that build up that's exciting it's that build up that build up and then you come and you want pizza so it's like maybe that just oh sorry wrong word maybe <laughs> something else but the build up is more exciting than the release sometimes i guess <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's, it, you know, I, I, I posted on my Instagram story about Jeremy Corbel's like, you know, the, the UFOs that are the documents that are coming out, like my, you guys are saying, and, and I just wrote boring. I was like, I'm bored. I'm bored by it. Cause it's another carrot on a stick. I feel like it's like, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. And we like that as Michael was saying, that process of being emotionally invested in that, you know, I'm not saying it's aliens, but it's aliens and <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's fascinating. All right. Well, I think uh, we're out of time. We do have uh, another opportunity following this interaction. There's a room which you can join for uh, a, Q, a quick uh, Q&A, or if you want to uh, unfold or develop some of the themes that we've been talking about so we can actually address these things. One thing that I do want to finish with, as both Michael and Jennifer were mentioning, um, 
these themes right around like the 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 historical processes that bring up and people were bringing Adam Curtis into this conversation. So there's a beautiful quote that opens and closes Adam, Adam Curtis's last uh, amazing documentary. Uh, and it's a quote actually by a, by a guy named uh, David Graeber, who's a, a well-known anthropologist, like kind of like an anarchist anthropologist, which is already two things that I'm very fond of. And he says, basically he says, the ultimate hidden truth of the world is that it is something that we make. And just as we make it, we could just as easily make it differently, which I think is precious in the sense that it sums up that actually we do have agency. And then what the world is like and what the world will be like is up to all of us. And it's not in the hands of some nefarious group controlling the things as we were puppet strings. The world is something that we make and we could just as well make differently. And we have that agency and we have that power and we have the capacity to dream and imagine what world we want to live in and then just build it. And this is why these conversations I think are very important because they bring back that sense of agency, that sense of power of saying like, oh yeah, I mean, things are not what they are just because that's a default state things are what they are because somebody make the, made them that way and we just may as well make them differently. If I can ramble for two more seconds, I think that that to me, it, like when, when I'm in that raw state to tie it back into psychedelics of coming out of a psychedelic trip, that is largely the feeling I have. It's, it's like I was just reminded of my power to make my own individual or at least change my perception of my individual world. And I guess we're right back at the circle because there's so many problems with once you start interpreting the world and once you start saying what the world is, right? But but maybe that's what we're doing. Maybe we're just chasing our chasing our tails. Yeah, Ouroboros. The beginning yeah. is the end. <laughs> Thank you everybody. Um, I appreciate it. I was enjoying. And again, I said, uh, you know, this whole conference has been worth it just if we can introduce people to the quarter experiment. Um, oh, yeah. 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 Robert Anton Wilson. Yeah. Prometheus um, Rising. You know, and it, <clears throat> excuse me. You know, it's, it's funny. You know, I've been reading Robert Anton Wilson for so long that, you know, someone said that the, the Robert Anton Wilson quote, don't believe everything you think. It took me a second to realize why that was revolutionary. I was like, of course, of course, don't believe everything you think. Um, what was my other thought? Oh, and what you're saying is, um, you know, Maharaji, where is he? He's right there. Um, you know, one of his big teachings was, it's better to love everybody than to try and figure it out. So that's been, uh, been one of my uh, practices. Love that. But um, are you saying that you might be able to answer some questions and hang out in the Ozo room? Yeah, sure, I'm down. I'd love to do that. Yeah. Okay, so I'll drop that in the channel here for a second. It's kind of a fun space. I'm sorry that we do have to keep the ships running on time. There's another talk right after this. Definitely not going to be as good as our talk, though, you know? <laughs> no, I mean, it's really just a bunch of lizards. Yeah, you got the lizard people on there. Let me stay for that one. Yeah. <laughs> They're not lizards. They're um, it's a bunch of dancing bears. You're being followed by hippies. No simple? Yep. No simple road people? Oh, awesome. Nice. Love those guys. <laughs> like, after a long day of this, it's just like, oh, let's just, like, sit on the couch with Aaron and Mel. Yeah, they're the best. Um, but it's been also nice um, sitting on the couch with you guys. Yeah, like yeah. Thank you, Daniel. So much, mm -hmm. Daniel. Where do? Oh, there's the link in there. There's the link. Okay, cool. See you on the other side. All right, everybody. Let's go and keep hanging out with um, with the lizard people, with the psychedelic narcissist, with the narcissistic rabbits. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Bye. See you over there.